2017 is finally the year that The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild comes out and myself and many others cannot wait to play it. There are many reasons to why I love this franchise, but first and foremost are the games. While many can argue that it's, it's always the same, I disagree by saying that the, while the story could seem a bit repetitive, it's the world, the gameplay, the characters you meet and the items you find are what make, for me, this series a masterpiece. And with all franchises, they all begin somewhere. In this new series of videos, I will explore the first game of a franchise. And to celebrate Breath of the Wild, let's go back to 1986, shall we? While working on the first Super Mario Bros, Miyamoto was also in charge of another project that would later be the game we know nowadays as The Legend of Zelda. The team differentiated their ideas in two projects. Mario Bros would have been a linear side-scroller, while Zelda would have been the complete opposite. While developing ideas for the game, originally one player designed the dungeon and the other player would have beaten it. It was fun and all, but Miyamoto couldn't shake that feeling of, I wanna play above ground too, so eventually he created Hyrule Field. This feeling of having a whole world to explore was taken by his childhood memories, of him exploring the lands around his hometown, getting lost and discovering incredible things. When I was a child, he said, I went hiking and found a lake. It was quite a surprise for me to stumble upon it. When I traveled around the country without a map, trying to find my way, stumbling on amazing things as I went, I realized how it felt to go on an adventure like this. The main character, Link, iconic hero of the franchise, was created by Miyamoto as a boy that started as an ordinary boy and in the end of the adventure becomes a hero. Miyamoto wanted this to represent a coming of age motive for kids, and the name Link was chosen because it links the player to the game. While designing Zelda, Miyamoto wanted an exotic name for a beautiful woman and said, Zelda was the name of the famous novelist F. Scott Fitzgerald. She was a famous and beautiful woman from all accounts, and I liked the sound of her name, so I took the liberty of using her name for the very first Zelda title. The Legend of Zelda was first released in February 1986 in Japan on the Famicom Disk System and was immediately a success. A year later, in June 1987, it was released in Europe and North America for the NES and it was well received there as well. It was the first NES game to sell over 1 million copies and is often regarded as one of the best NES games ever, or even one of the best games ever made. Its graphics and music were praised, its story was praised. But it was especially the adventure, the world, the challenge, and the dungeons that resonated in gamers' minds. Zelda wasn't any other game, it was THE game. It was complex, long, difficult, and it made people talk to each other. People exchanged hints, tricks, puzzle solutions, dungeon whereabouts, and secret items placed around the map. This was exactly what Miyamoto wanted, that the players communicate with each other. And it's exactly why you don't start with your sword so you are forced to share your knowledge of the game. But what about the game itself? What is it that makes it so special? Can a game of three decades ago still be enjoyed today? Let's find out. Starting from the title screen, you know this is no ordinary game. This is a legend. The Legend of Zelda to be precise. And then after you choose your name, you are immediately thrust in the overworld. With no direction whatsoever. And then you hear it. And your heart melts. Anyway, apart from the amazing main team that has become iconic in gaming, let's talk about the overworld. The world in The Legend of Zelda is huge for an NES game, and when it came out it blowed people's socks off. Hyrule was a land full of different biomes like forests, deserts, mountains and rivers. As Wikipedia states, open world, free roam or sandbox are terms for video games where a player can move freely through a virtual world and is given considerable freedom in regard to how and when to approach particular objectives, as opposed to other video games that have a more linear structure to their gameplay. So basically, yeah, we can classify Zelda as an open world game. It has all the characteristics listed above, as you can go wherever you want and you can do the dungeons in any particular order. Nowadays, more and more games are becoming or already are open world, and the market is almost oversaturated by them. However, one fundamental thing that many developers tend to forget is that it doesn't matter how big your world is if there isn't anything in the world to actually keep me interested. Zelda does not have this problem, as every area you visit has a few enemies you can battle and there are a ton of secret items you can discover, and the vast majority of them are practically impossible to find unless you have a guide, a friend telling you, or you run around burning every bush possible. Now let's get in the meat of the game. 
The dungeons. The dungeons. The dungeons. Since this game, Zelda has been famous for alternating splendid different Hyrule for you to explore to gloomy, elaborate dungeons for you to solve. In this game, every dungeon works like this. You find the entrance, which is scattered somewhere around the map, and inside you can find three things. The first two are the compass and the map, which help you navigate around the dungeon, but are mandatory. And the third one is the key item. These key items are another part of what makes Zelda special for me. Each of these have a specific function, and while others are more useful than others, like the bow, when you find the correct way to use them is just amazing. Sometimes, getting these items are even essential to defeating the boss, like the bombs for King Dodongo. And here we arrive to another great part of Zelda, the bosses. Here, they aren't some bullet sponge you just continually stab over and over. You have to carefully plan out your tactics, sometimes use specific items to weaken them or even to just attack them, and they are all a force to be reckoned with. Let's say you've miraculously managed to survive until you've completed all the dungeons except the last one and you got almost all the key items and most of the secondary ones. What now? Well, what awaits you is Death Mountain. And it's called like that for a reason. The final dungeon is a massive 57 room enemy filled death trap that's just waiting to consume all your precious potions and kill you again and again and again. If you manage to conquer Death Mountain, the final boss Ganon awaits you, and Zelda herself gives you some silver arrows you pop in Ganon's crew and you'll be greeted by the most gruesome death scene on the NES. Congratulations, you finished the first quest. Oh yeah, did I mention that there is also a second quest? If you beat the game or you put Zelda as your final name, you unlock this new game plus, but all the dungeons are revamped, so you're basically playing a game sized DLC, and not many people knew about it. So there you have it. Now you know all about the genesis of this saga, and one of the reasons to why it has garnered so much attention nowadays. Yeah, I say one of the reasons, as it is very rare to see a series be so praised for only the first game. After this, there have been numerous other Zelda games, and some have had even more impact. So let's all hope that Breath of the Wild will not only be a good game, but also a revolutionary one, or at least for the franchise. See you in the next video.